So iron in the body is absorbed as dietary iron, either as heme or ferric iron. It's subsequently converted to ferrous iron and then ultimately absorbed in the, uh, in the GI tract. Now, iron itself is then transported through the system via ferritin and, and stored via ferritin. It is, uh, it exits and enters our, the various storage mechanisms via a doorway of ferroportin. You can see here in the schematic, after iron enters the GI tract, it is, um, it, it uses ferroportin to be transported throughout the system. Uh, and then ultimately is stored in the reticular endothelial system and can be used uh, by the end, end tissues. So what are the reasons for reduced iron, um, uh, especially absolute iron deficiency? Here you could see, of course, if you have low iron intake, a low protein diet, or um, uh, um, uh, um, other forms of um, low GI intake, that would lead to uh, iron deficiency. Furthermore, there could be a primary absorption issue. Um, this might be common in patients with cardiorenal metabolic disorders in which overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system might lead to decreased mesenteric or portal blood flow uh, and, and thus uh, reduced GI absorption. Furthermore, patients might be concomitantly treated by medications that may actually induce often slow bleeding commonly in the GI tract, but perhaps increasingly recognized and most common in patients with chronic illnesses like heart failure is this issue of chronic inflammation. And so why would chronic inflammation link to iron deficiency? Well, chronic inflammation impairs the tissue's ability to actually release iron and ultimately for the cell's ability to utilize iron. So let's go over that. The master regulator of inflammation in iron deficiency and heart failure is hepcidin. So hepcidin, much like other inflammatory, um, uh, uh, um, uh, in uh, inflammatory types, increase in states like heart failure. Um, hepcidin then blocks the initial absorption via ferroportin of iron and also blocks ferroportin's ability to actually um, enter and exit end organ tissues such as the reticular endothelial system. So ultimately, even if iron stores are adequate, because of this hepcidin-induced block, the body's unable to actually utilize iron, and that can lead to downstream issues. So this is the ideal scenario. You have iron, iron intake, that's uh, about 8 to 18 milligrams. You have duodenal absorption. Ultimately, it is stored, and the body uh, goes about its uh, daily functioning. We talked about those initial steps that could break down. You could have decreased absorption, decreased initial intake. Uh, however, uh, perhaps uh, equally or more importantly, you could also have decreased bioavailability, and that's mediated through that inflammatory cascade and heart failure. Um, and uh, mediated by this master regulator, hepcidin. So in patients with heart failure, they often have detectable high levels of hepcidin. We don't measure this uh, entity clinically, but in research settings, you can tell that this, these patients have elevated levels of hepcidin, and those patients are particularly prone to iron deficiency. So iron deficiency at the epidemiological scale is very common in heart failure. And you can see here that uh, in this international pooled analysis, about 50% of people had some evi biochemical evidence of iron deficiency. But importantly, iron deficiency uh, burden increases with severity of illness. The New York Heart Association classification is a common classification for severity of heart failure. You can see as we march to the right as we increase in terms of severity of heart failure to New York Heart Association Functional Class 3 and 4, where patients have symptoms at even rest or with minimal exertion, you can see the burden of uh, iron deficiency with or without anemia is quite a bit more common, approaching 75-80%.
This marches across a whole variety of clinical studies over the last decade that have attempted to understand the footprint of iron deficiency in the epidemiology of heart failure. You can see that it ranges in chronic heart failure from anywhere from 35 to 70 percent. But I'll draw your attention to the right hand portion of the screen in which you can see that in the acute setting, ADHF is acute decompensated heart failure. So in people who are hospitalized for heart failure, iron deficiency is often the rule rather than the exception. And iron deficiency occurs in about 70 to 80% of people when tested. And this persists in the early post-discharge window. So that hospitalization for heart failure really identifies a high-risk cohort, not only for clinical progression, but also for iron deficiency. So critically, iron deficiency alone, even without the downstream association of anemia, has prognostic significance. So these are uh, uh, data on the, first, on the first panel. You can see that patients with or without iron deficiency, in um, uh, uh, patients in that red trajectory of patients with coexisting iron deficiency and heart failure have worse cumulative survival. Um, the right hand, though, tells the real story, and this is now breaks it down further, iron deficiency with or without anemia. So even people without anemia, you can see on that, um, uh, on, on, on the third bar there, iron deficiency without anemia face excess risks of mortality. And that is really a, uh, a, a crit critical to the diagnosis of iron deficiency. Because as you, you'll see, it does not require the co concurrent presence of anemia. So here is uh, really now a snapshot look at functional iron deficiency. Um, we'll go over some of the diagnostic criteria in just a moment. But iron deficiency, uh, especially in the context of heart failure and even functional iron deficiency syndromes are common and adversely prognostic. So this is, um, in the US, we estimate about six to seven million uh, Americans with heart failure. We estimate about 50% have concomitant anemia. Uh, as I mentioned, the concurrent presence of iron deficiency, which is not entirely overlapping, is about also about 50%. Uh, you can see here uh, on the right hand that patients, even over a long-term trajectory, of three years face worse uh, event-free survival. So how does iron deficiency actually impact clinical prognosis? We talked about the epidemiology, the mortality statistics, but critically, iron deficiency typically is associated with this linear pathway of iron deficiency leading to decreased hemoglobin, uh, induced anemia, and then ultimately decreased O2 delivery and the uh, adverse effects associated with anemia. However, there's this whole spectrum of enzymes that critically rely on iron in terms of their oxidative processes that directly lead to decreased uh, oxygen utilization. And so when thinking through that, many of those aerobic enzymes lead to decreased oxidative uh, phosphorylation, the presence of iron deficiency, decreased ATP production and decreased O2 utilization. Many of those uh, um, uh, elements um, really rely on iron, the mitochondria, cellular oxygen storing processes, cellular energy release mechanisms, erythropoiesis, and then uh, uh, reactive oxygen species metabolism mechanisms. So all of these alternative pathways in addition to hemoglobin, which is the common association, rely on iron. And so in the presence of iron deficiency, we really do see a multitude of effects, not only in the heart, but on the system at, at large. So beyond mortality, which is of course important to patients, patients also uh, are um, concerned about their daily living and their quality of life. And so in heart failure, we have a variety of patient reported outcomes. This is just one of those uh, called the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. And you can see here consistently across the board, there are substantial decrements in health status as measured by this sensitive uh, uh, health, question, health status questionnaire in heart failure. 
in which iron deficiency is associated with worse health status and health-related quality of life. And that's most importantly, irrespective of anemia. The bottom here, you can see the breakdown of, in red, no anemia. In blue, with anemia, you can see those are about similar. So in the presence of iron deficiency, you really do have marked decrements in, in health status, irrespective of anemia. So just a quick word on uh, the overall diagnosis of iron deficiency, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. So we started this discussion about absolute iron deficiency. That's that initial pathway of chronic blood loss, malnutrition, malabsorption. This is really going to be diagnosed by reduced iron stores. And so you're going to look for a ferritin, which is the ultimate storage mechanism for iron to be markedly reduced, often in this range of less than 30, to be diagnosing absolute iron deficiency. Functional iron deficiency often is that those stores are normal, so serum ferritin levels can be in the normal range, 100 to 300. However, the iron's ability to be utilized is reduced, and that is measured by Tsat, so that's less than uh, transferrin saturation is less than 20%. And so that transport mechanism is not being saturated because of the inability to utilize iron. So this schematic is helpful. Uh, it places the two key diagnostic tests, serum ferritin and Tsat, on a, uh, on a plot. So you can see T uh, serum ferritin is on the x-axis, ranging from zero to markedly elevated. And Tsat, again, is uh, the amount of transferrin that's saturated in the blood, 0 to 100 percent. So I, th I find it easy to go over the extremes. So the bottom left, where you have very low ferritin, uh, is the definition of absolute iron deficiency. So these are your, think about your bleeding states or your uh, reduced oral intake states that are substantial. On the other hand, on the far, far uh, um, right-hand corner, you can see iron overload states. And so this is really distinguished by markedly elevated serum ferritin and also saturated transferrin. In between is where most patients exist. And here is where functional iron deficiency is diagnosed. And critically, patients will have normal or even slightly elevated ferritin levels but reduced transferrin saturation, so less than 20%. That's the classic form of functional iron deficiency. So again, key laboratory measures, serum ferritin, Tsat. Ultimately, trans serum ferritin is strongly associated with how much chronic iron stores we have in the system. Roughly about one unit of serum ferritin corresponds to about 10 milligrams of tissue iron. Uh, these thresholds certainly do vary across disease states, but in heart failure, this is the key diagnostic scheme. Ferritin levels that are either markedly elevated, of course, signaling absolute iron deficiency, but for functional iron deficiency, we're looking for a Tsat less than 20% in the presence of a ferritin between 100 and 300. So this is a, a rough scheme. You have a patient with heart failure, measure your iron labs. And that's commonly not done, but the key labs are ferritin and Tsat. Um, if they meet these diagnostic criteria, either substantial deficiency with uh, serum ferritin less than 100 or a Tsat less than 20%, check their, iron, uh, their anemia status. And while I said it's not critical to diagnose iron deficiency, it is important to understand the mechanism. So if someone is substantially anemic, you do want to exclude other causes of concomitant anemia other than iron deficiency. If those aren't present, um, then you're looking at I IV, uh, um, iron deficiency treatment, and that's what we'll spend the rest of the session on. So I'd like to next introduce and um, uh, invite up my colleague, Dr. Gale, who will be talking about treatment of iron deficiency.